Chapter 5 of a Narrative of the Life of Rev. Noah Davis, a Colored Man. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Brian Ness. A Narrative of the Life of Rev. Noah Davis, a Colored Man, by himself. Chapter 5. Experience in Baltimore, Education, Purchase of a Wife and Two Children, Great Distress of Mind, Generous Assistance, and Church Matters. When I came among the colored people of Baltimore, I found to my surprise that they were advanced in education, quite beyond what I had conceived of. Of course, as I never had such advantages, I was far behind the people, and as this did not appear well in a preacher, I felt very small when comparing my abilities with others of superior stamp. I found that the great mass of colored professors of religion were Methodists, whose piety and zeal seemed to carry all before them. There were at that time some ten or eleven colored Methodist churches, one Episcopalian, one Presbyterian, and one little Baptist church located upon the outskirts of the city. The most of the Methodist churches were large and influential, and the Presbyterian Church had one of the best Sabbath schools for colored children in the city. But the Baptist colored membership was looked upon as the smallest, and under these circumstances I was surrounded with discouragements. Although the ministers and brethren of other denominations have always treated me with marked Christian kindness. I had never had a day's schooling, and coming to one of the first cities in the Union where the colored people had the advantages of schools and where their pulpits were occupied Sabbath after Sabbath by comparatively intelligent colored ministers, what could I expect but that the people would turn away from one who was trying to preach in the room of a private house some fifteen by twenty feet? God had called me to the work, and it was His cause I was advocating. I found that to preach like other preachers I must improve my mind by reading the Bible and other good books and by studying my own language. I started afresh. I got a small stock of books, and the white brethren loaned and gave me other useful volumes to which they added a word of instruction and encouragement whenever an opportunity offered, and the ministers cordially invited me to attend their Monday ministerial conference meeting, which was very useful to me. I had now been in Baltimore more than a year. My wife and seven children were still in Virginia. I went to see them as often as my circumstances permitted, three or four times a year. About this time, my wife's mistress agreed to sell to me my wife and our two youngest children. The price fixed was $800 cash, and she gave me 12 months to raise the money. The sun rose bright in my sky that day, but before the year was out, my prospects were again in darkness. Now I had two great burdens upon my mind, one to attend properly to my missionary duty, the other to raise $800. During this time, we succeeded in getting a better place for the Sabbath school, and there was a larger attendance upon my preaching, which demanded reading and study, and also visiting, and increased my daily labors. On the other hand, the year was running away, in which I had to raise $800, so that I found myself at times in a great strait. My plan to raise the money was to secure the amount first by pledges before I collected any. Finally, the year was more than passed away, and I had upon my subscription list about one-half of the money needed. It was now considered that the children had increased in value $100, and I was told that I could have them by paying in cash $600 and giving a bond with good security for 300 more, payable in 12 months. I had six weeks in which to consummate this matter. I felt deeply that this was a time to pray the Lord to help me, and for this my wife's prayers were fervently offered with my own. I had left my wife in Virginia and come to Baltimore, a distance of over a hundred miles. I had been separated thus for nearly three years. I had been trying to make arrangements to have her with me for over twelve months, and as yet had failed. We were oppressed with the most gloomy forebodings, and could only kneel down together and pray for God's direction and help. I was in Fredericksburg and had but one day longer to stay and spend with my wife. What could be done must be done quickly. I went to my old friend, Mr. Wright, and stated my case to him. 
After hearing of all I had done, and the conditions I had to comply with, he told me that if I would raise the six hundred dollars cash, he would endorse my bond for the remaining three hundred. This promise inspired me with new life. The next thing was, how could the six hundred dollars be obtained in six weeks? I had upon my subscription list and in pledges nearly four hundred dollars, but this had to be collected from friends living in Fredericksburg, Washington City, Baltimore, and Philadelphia. I left Fredericksburg and spent a few days in Washington to collect what I could of the money promised to me there, and met much encouragement, several friends doubling their subscriptions. When I arrived in Baltimore and made known the peculiar strait I was in, to my joyful surprise, some of the friends who had pledged five dollars gave me ten, and one dear friend who had promised me ten dollars for this object and who had previously contributed largely in the purchase of myself now gave me fifty. I began to count up, and in two weeks from the time I commenced collecting, I had in hand four hundred dollars. Presently, another very dear friend inquired of me how I was getting along, and when I told him, he said, "Bring your money to me." I did so. It lacked two hundred dollars to make the purchase. This, the best friend I ever had in the world, made up the six hundred dollars and said, "Go get your wife, and you can keep on collecting and repay the two hundred dollars when you get able." I was now overcome with gratitude and joy, and knew not what to say. And when I began to speak, he would not have any of my thanks. I went to my boarding house and shut myself up in my room, where I might give vent to the gratitude of my heart. And oh, what a melting time I had! It was to me a day of thanksgiving. Having now in hand the six hundred dollars and the promise of Mr. Wright's security for three hundred more, I was by twelve o'clock next day in Fredericksburg. At first sight, my wife was surprised that I had come back so soon, for it was only two weeks since I had left her. And when I informed her that I had come after her and the children, she could hardly believe me. In a few days, having duly arranged all things relative to the purchase and removal, we left for Baltimore with feelings commingled with joy and sorrow—sorrow sorrow at the parting with five of our older children and our many friends, and rejoicing in the prospect of remaining together permanently in the missionary field where God had called me to labor. I arrived in Baltimore with my wife and two little ones, November fifth, eighteen fifty-one, and stopped with Sister Hester Ann Hughes, a worthy member of the M.E. Church, with whom I had been boarding for four years. The Maryland Baptist Union Association was now in session here, and it became my duty to prepare my church letter and missionary report for that body. The church had now been organized just three years, commencing with only four members, including the pastor. Our church statistics for the year, as reported, were baptized two, received by letter two, present number of members fifteen, Sabbath school much revived under the special efforts of several white brethren and sisters, present number of Sunday scholars fifty. This year was a joyful one to me. My little church increasing and the Sabbath school flourishing under the superintendence of the late, truly excellent brother James C. Crane, though he was with us but for a short season. My wife and little ones were also with me, both in the church and Sabbath school. I was a happy man and felt more than ever inclined to give thanks to God and serve Him to the best of my ability. My salary was only three hundred dollars a year, but with hard exertion and close economy, together with my wife's taking in washing and going out at day's work, we were enabled by the first of the year to pay the two hundred dollars our dear friend had loaned us in raising the six hundred dollars before spoken of. But the bond for three hundred dollars was now due, and how must this be met? I studied out a plan which was to get some gentlemen who might want a little servant girl to take my child and advance me three hundred dollars for the purpose of paying my note, which was now due in Virginia. In this plan, I succeeded and had my own life insured for seven years for five hundred dollars, and made it over to this gentleman as security until I ultimately paid him the whole amount, though I was several years in paying it. Among the number that joined our little church was a young brother, Joseph M. Harden, who was baptized by Dr. Fuller, but soon became a valuable member with us, both in the church and Sunday school. He was born in Baltimore and had been early taught to read. And though he had been at ten years old, bound out till he was twenty-one, his love of books had made him far superior to colored people generally, and he was very valuable to me. 
Things had gone on hopefully with me and my little church, though our progress was very slow, but we had to suffer a loss in Brother Hardin's leaving us for the great missionary field in Africa, where I trust the Lord has sent him for a great and happy work. But God has blessed us in the person of Brother Samuel W. Madden, whose labors as a licensed preacher for several years have been invaluable to us. End of chapter 5 Recorded by Brian Ness